This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. First up today, I'm visiting with Renu Couture, president of the University of Houston, explaining how she is really focused that university on energy. Following that, I sit down with Bob Pekovich, founder of Ionic Oil, an energy startup company separating oil from those valuable tar sands. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to the Energy Maker Show. I'm here with the president of the University of Houston, chancellor of the University of Houston system, Renu Couture. Renu, thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, thank you, Paul. It's just a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted. Well, I have heard so many great things about your efforts uh, to, to really uh, uh, position the, universe, the University of Houston in a different light. Uh, we're deep in the heart of energy country. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing? Well, University of Houston is a large metropolitan public university. Uh, our graduates, uh, after graduating, they stay right here, and therefore, our bonding with the city here, or what are the strength of the city, are really very important. And what is Houston known for? Of course, it's the energy capital of the world. Sure. And we want to make sure that Houston remains as the new leader in all energy-related endeavors. We have focused very hard in making University of Houston a contributory member to the energy strength of Houston. Now, I've heard some good things about this. Uh, is it a research park? What we needed was to really synergize the talent of the faculty with the practical aspect and the experience that the, the leadership in the industry brings here to the yes. table. So we did a couple of things. One is um, I invited, actually I should say I pleaded to the CEOs and presidents of major energy companies to come and be part of this uh, vision, to come and be part of this new uh, new direction for the university that we have, and they have been very gracious with their time. And the other thing we did was to um, really make these ideas concrete. We purchased uh, some property around the university. We have purchased actually 150 acres of land, wow. and on 75 acres of land, we are developing an energy research park. And this land already has 14 buildings, so we have about 500,000 um, uh, 500, square feet of uh, built-up area that we need to really retrofit and make it, you know, uh, appropriate. And uh, we just decided to bring in the uh, research uh, centers and institutes and faculty from the university, and with the help of these energy leaders, to bring in uh, the, the needs uh, and uh, the talent from what we have in the city. And the idea is that this place, Energy Research Park at the University of Houston, would become a focal point. It would be a place where private sector, public sector, academic sector would come together and look for those solutions, take those kinds of gambles and risks and be part of that innovation. That's going to be absolutely necessary if we are to solve the energy problems of tomorrow. Now, are there certain technologies within the energy space that, that you see being focused on uh, more, uh, whether it's water or exploration and production? There are several that we are very much focused on. Of course, uh, oil and gas just being, you know, such a headquarter of oil and gas. How can we um, reach to, uh, to that part of oil and gas and that's not explorable right now? And, and uh, also, how do we do it in an environmentally friendly way? 
So I think that's a big focus. But in addition to that, wind energy is a is a is a critical uh, element for us. We are known at the University of Houston for our superconductive research. I mean, we have um, members of National Academy who have uh, been working in this field, and we have just now recruited a team of 15 scientists to come. Wow. And these are the more what I call translational scientists. So we have those who are doing basic research in superconductivity, and then we have translational people. We have been able to recruit uh, superpower um, to come from, uh, from New York and uh, establish one wing here. So with the help of our leaders in the academic world and with these private sector leaders, the Texas Center for Superconductivity is now engaged in some really exciting things. They are um, starting to manufacture some uh, very highly efficient superconductive generators, right. wires, cables. They are also working on electric grid. Um, and I think some of these things are the future. And I just feel very excited about it because one excitement is, of course, to see things go from bench to the marketplace immediately. Second thing to see is the synergy. I mean, when I go and visit the park, you can see it just, just every day, it's just developing. You can see um, energy companies are getting very excited. And it's not just research, we're doing a lot of training there. We're doing a lot of educational programs there too. Well, it's amazing. So the, the park really does take it from the idea all the way through uh, to, to commercialization. Well, I, th I think it's in a very infant stage right now. Right. Uh, there are some other areas that we, centers that we already have, and uh, one of them is um, a Center for Advanced Materials. And what and we have a wind offshore wind testing technology center there. What our researchers are focused on is um, how is it that you can make the the material on those um, the wind turbines strong enough so that it can withstand the hurricanes or the storms because we saw the damage that sure, was caused. Course. And I think uh, complementary uh, sort of expertise would be the best thing for us to have because uh, what we see in that park is uh, incubation of uh, new new companies. Uh, I like to see our faculty and I'm, I'm really trying to encourage our faculty to see that they right after their research that they find that they ought to think about how can they commercialize this technology. We have um, centers, we have uh, in a business, university business uh, partnership, uh, we have university industry uh, partnership center all of these together, the idea is, how is it that whatever our scientists find in their labs, how is it that we take it out and immediately put it for the advancement of the society? So the new thing for us has been, previously we had great scientists, they were working in their labs and they were working individually. Right. The new thing now is that they're working together, they are working with the industry, and they are working with in a consortium with other universities. Well, and it's something that you don't often see from research institutions. I, I know our own federal government struggles uh, with mm -hmm. its national lab network, mm -hmm. where they will constantly invent, yet they will never commercialize. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this seemed to me to be a great solution to that problem of partnering industry, those that know how to scale, with the right. researchers wh wh who have these new ideas. Right, and if I can bring to that, there, there are two other elements that are really very positive for us. One is Texas is very heavily focused on commercialization. We right. have a fund uh, with it, with the, in the governor's office right. that we can tap in to bring uh, talent to Texas at the same time to use it for a startup. So I think that is a very good incentive. The second thing is, being a very comprehensive university, we have super duper talent, not just in science and engineering, but also in the School of Business. We have a School of Law. We also have a Hobby Center of Public Policy. Hmm. And what we've tried to do is to really connect these interdisciplinary folks who have no other reason to be part of it. So when we started our energy initiative, it became just a magnet to invite people in political science, in economics, in education, 
along with uh, with the folks from geosciences and from chemistry and chemical engineering and uh, then law professors our law professors and professors from business are co-teaching a course on carbon trading hugely popular sure. course well renew you're a visionary you're a tremendous leader and i hope uh, that you'll come back uh, on to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you so today. much. And that wraps my discussion with Renu Couture, President of the University of Houston and Chancellor of the University of Houston System. And we'll be right back. The future is here. At NRG, we're providing clean energy and now charging stations to make the electric car a reality. Kind of makes you want a boogie-woogie, doesn't it? NRG, moving clean energy forward. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to the Energy Maker Show. Uh, we have with us today serial entrepreneur, founder of Ionic Oil, Bob Pekovic. Bob, welcome to the Energy Maker Show. Well, thanks for having me here today. Absolutely. Now, tell me about this new company, Ionic Oil. Sure. Ionic Oil was founded uh, basically in my kitchen, uh, Paul, because uh, I, I figured that uh, if it can't do it in my kitchen, it's way too complicated. Right. So what, what we have done is basically uh, found a liquid, we call an ionic liquid, that actually removes heavy hydrocarbons from oil sand or oil rocks. So you're separating uh, this, this uh, hard to get to or hard to separate oil from tar sands? Yeah, it's actually very difficult. And right now, the current process, they use very high temperatures, they use steam, and they use uh, very caustic sodium hydroxide to strip off the oil from the oil sands, which uses a lot of water, causes a lot of environmental problems with caustic tailings ponds, and a lot of pollution from the leftover fines in the, in the tailings ponds themselves. All right, well, I definitely want to get into the technology, but you know, for a lot of our viewers, you know, they, they don't quite get the concept that we've got a lot of oil uh, that's out there. Uh, it's just when the price points are low, it's just ec not economic to get to that oil. Is this one of these technologies that that when prices of oil are low, it's not economic, but now that they're high, it's more economic? Well, I think in uh, general, if th this process is about one-fourth to one-eighth the cost of existing extraction technologies, wow. so when I talk about sands. So, you know, at, at Right now, it costs five to eight dollars a barrel to strip the oil from the sands. My process is one to two dollars a barrel, based on some preliminary trials we've done. So I don't think the price will affect it that much. But I think anything over forty dollars a barrel is a pretty good home, pretty good deal. And to to set the stage, uh, describe to our viewers who don't quite understand what a tar sand is. What is it? Well, basically, it's a uh, it's it's actually strip mined, uh, it's surface mined, and it's a sand that. Can, contains very viscous or heavy uh, hydrocarbon oil. Uh, it sort of has the texture of crunchy peanut butter. And uh, that, that's basically what it looks like if, if you see it in person and it smells like oil. Right. And uh, what we're trying to do now is, is se separate that with a very low energy process. And I know you've told me there's a fair amount of that in Canada. Is it exclusively in Canada? Actually, worldwide, there's uh, the equivalent of about 500 billion barrels of oil sands. Uh, most of it's in Canada. The, s the second deposit is in Venezuela. And believe it or not, there's about 40 million barrel, 40 billion barrel equivalent of oil sands in the United States, with most, most of that being in Utah. All right. So walk, walk me through the process of stripping this oil from, from the sand. Specifically, what, what is this ionic fluid? Well, ionic liquid basically is a s liquid salt at room temperature. But not only is it a salt, but it has very unique electrical properties. And I'm taking advantage of the electrical properties of that salt to actually strip the oil from sand or rock very efficiently and with very low amounts of energy. Now, I understand you were uh, kind enough to bring some tar sand with you? Sure. All right. Can can you walk walk me through this process of separating the oil from the sand? 
So here, I brought some tar sands here, and you can see it. Uh, it sort of has a rock-like appearance. I'm actually holding it here. And it uh, actually has about 10 to 13% by weight oil in this sand or huh. attached to the sand. Now I'm going to take this sand, and I'm going to then put it into the ionic liquid, which looks like this. It's a bluish liquid. And with a very small amount of energy, either mechanical or microwave energy, which raises the temperature slightly, uh, and a little agitation, we do this. In about 15 seconds, the oil is stripped. You can see the sand on the bottom, and you can see the oil ionic liquid uh, layer on top of it here that has stripped the oil off the sand with the, within a few seconds. Incredible. Have, have you looked at any other... Uh, you know, we, we've talked about tar sands. Are there any other applications uh, for this? Uh, uh, shale plays or, or other? Well, I've done some very preliminary work on uh, shale, and I was able to strip shale. It took a little longer. It took about 30 seconds versus four or five seconds for the, uh, for the sand. And I've been approached by several large oil companies looking at uh, possibly using this in, in uh, an underground, uh, like SAG-D processes, where they'd use, use this in place of steam or organics to, uh, to separate oil out underground. But I haven't done much work in that area. Now, Bob, you're a serial entrepreneur. I've, I've seen you take a variety of companies from idea to execution to commercialization and exit. Uh, walk, walk me through the path of commercialization for this technology, some of the challenges that you're going to face um, up front, and then what's the path uh, to, to win? Sure. Well, the first thing I had to do is make sure we get a good intellectual property position. And now that has taken place. There's two patents pending, uh, one on the ionic oil process itself, separation process, and the second on how to recycle the ionic fluid to reduce the economics of the process. Uh, that's first step. Second step is now to um, uh, get a what I call a Series A round investment. Uh, we're looking for somewhere around $2 million. And uh, what we do with those proceeds is use it to build a, a truck-mounted or portable unit that we can take out and do some serious field trials uh, in either Canadian sands or oil shale opportunities. And if that goes well, th and that should be sufficient to get a Series B round or larger and take the company on to much greater heights or, or much greater value for the shareholders. Well, Bob, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I hope you'll come back and keep us posted uh, on the company. And that wraps this episode of the Energy Makers Show. I'm Paul Dickerson, and we'll see you next week.